Have you ever wondered how scientists seem to have this ability to pick a point and program a spacecraft to either land on or orbit that exact point? Or how they can track and monitor asteroids in space to make sure there isn't one hurtling towards Earth? Now I know these calculations and predictive models are beyond the scope of our study, but they are all fundamentally based on underlying concepts of displacement, velocity, and acceleration. And that's why it's so important for us to study them. Now we use words like distance and speed in our daily lives. And we have a pretty good understanding of what they are. Distance describes how far apart two points are. And for a moving object, it describes how far that object has traveled. Speed refers to how fast an object is moving. In other words, how much distance it covers per unit time. But both these measures only deal with the magnitude of traveling, not the direction, and are therefore scalar quantities. However, we do have the upgraded vector versions of these measures, and they're really important in science and engineering, because they provide a more detailed account of what's actually happening. So, the vector quantity that deals with distance is called displacement and it shows the amount of distance traveled along with the direction of traveling from a particular point of reference. Now the direction of distance traveled is usually shown by a plus or minus sign before the value, depending on the direction that that object is traveling. It can also be denoted with an angle to suggest the direction of the movement. For example, we can say a person has moved 100 meters 60 degrees east of north. Now the rate of change of displacement is called velocity, which is the vector version of speed. Velocity shows how fast an object is moving and in what direction with respect to a reference point. Now it's important to note that if there's more than one moving object, they should all be in the same direction of our chosen reference point. For objects reducing the displacement between them and the reference point, that is objects that are moving towards the reference point, their velocity is negative. And for objects increasing the displacement between them and the reference point, that is, they're moving away from the reference point, the velocity is positive. But what does this mean in the real world? Well, let's take the example of a runner going up and down a path. He's tracking his movements using a set of distance time and displacement time graphs. Now these graphs are nothing fancy. They're just records of an object's distance and displacement at different points in time. But they're very useful because they can help us determine speed, velocity, and acceleration. Distance time graphs record an object's distance traveled with respect to time. And what this means is, as the object moves, the graph adds the distance. Now this has some interesting applications. For example, we can use it to calculate the speed of an object at any given time by finding the slope of the graph at that point. And this is because the slope will be measuring the rate of change of distance traveled, which is essentially speed. And the greater the slope, the faster an object is moving at that particular point in time. Now this graph can also capture acceleration and deceleration, and it does this in the form of curves. Since acceleration is an increase in speed, and speed is shown by the slope of the graph, a curve where the slope is becoming more positive, that is, it's going upwards, it shows acceleration. On the other hand, a curve where the slope is becoming more negative, or going downwards, it shows deceleration. Let's talk about the displacement time graph now. Now these record the displacement of an object from a reference point with respect to time. Unlike a distance time graph though, a displacement graph can move both up and down. Now since the distance is being measured from a reference point, whenever the moving object moves closer to the point, the displacement will decrease, which is recorded as a lowering of the graph. Now we can use the displacement time graphs to calculate the velocity of the moving object at any given point in time. We do this by, again, finding the slope of the graph at that point. So when the slope is positive and steep, the object is moving fast and moving away from the reference point. Consequently, when the slope is negative, 
This means the object is moving towards a reference point at a certain velocity. In short, in a displacement time graph, the steepness of the slope shows the magnitude of the velocity. That is, the steeper the slope, the faster an object is traveling. Similarly, the positivity or negativity of the slope represents the direction of the velocity. Meaning, a positive slope shows a positive velocity, which means the object is moving away from the reference point. And a negative slope shows a negative velocity, which means the object is moving towards the reference point. Now, just like distance time graphs, the displacement time graph also shows acceleration through curves. Curves with increasing slopes show increasing velocity and therefore acceleration and curves with decreasing slopes show decreasing velocity and therefore deceleration. Now that we know how these graphs work, let's get back to our runner. Now as she starts from rest, she has to accelerate to her running speed. And since acceleration is the rate of change of speed or velocity, we'll see it as a curve on both graphs. Now as she gets to the desired running speed, both graphs show a straight line. And this shows that the distance is now increasing at the same rate. Once she reaches the other end and stops, both graphs show a deceleration and an eventual stoppage as the curve flattening. And this flat line with no slope shows that the object is at rest. Now it's time for the runner to turn around and head back. And this is where the distance time graph and the displacement time graph start to diverge. Since the distance time graph is recording a scalar quantity, it only counts the additional distance that the runner is traveling and therefore starts moving upwards again. But the displacement time graph is recording a vector quantity and the runner is now heading back towards the reference point. This means that the displacement between the runner and the reference point is starting to decrease, which is why the displacement time graph starts moving downwards. Now, as the runner gets to the speed she wants to, as she's moving down the track, we see straight lines on the two graphs again, but the slopes are different this time. For the distance time graph, the slope will be the same as it was when she started running first, because again, it's a scalar quantity. But for the displacement time graph, the slope represents velocity, which is the vector quantity, and therefore adopts a negative slope, since the runner's direction is now the opposite. Now, as she arrives at this starting point again, both graphs level off again. The only difference is that for the distance time graph, the leveling off happens at a value of twice the length of the track because she's run up at once and then back down once. Whereas for the displacement time graph, the leveling off happens at zero because she's back exactly at her starting or reference point. So the net displacement is zero. Now these differences between distance and displacement and speed and velocity are extremely important to understand, especially for aerospace engineers, pilots, and even ship captains, because these concepts govern navigation and logistics, and they're fundamental to how travel and transportation works around the world.